Tonight's teaching is titled, Spiritual Apathy. Spiritual apathy is a lack of spiritual enthusiasm. It's um, lukewarm, almost indifferent attitude towards God and God's people. And we all need to be very vigilant against this soul-deforming disease called spiritual apathy because it can happen to the most sincere of us Christians at one point or another in our life. Take for example, you could be attending prayer meetings week after week and yet with no real keenness in your heart to fellowship with the Lord. Our attendance here could be a mere sure, something that we simply do week after week that needs to be ticked off that to-do list. Or our attendance here could be out of responsibility, a need to show ourselves as present, <laughs> to win the favor of man rather than that of God. We could sing and clap at a praise and worship session, and yet, almost mechanically, with our heart and our mind in faraway la-la land, we lack the sincerity in our exaltations of the Lord. And we could sit through and through a teaching session, <laughs> and yet not absorb a single word of God. So let us learn a little more about this soul-deforming disease called spiritual apathy so that we can identify its symptoms and then we can work towards restoring the spiritual fervor in our lives. And for this, we're going to look at a very interesting story about a man who fell asleep in the church. <laughs> it's narrated in Acts chapter 20, verses 7 to 12. It was the first day of the week. All the believers had gathered together to fellowship, to break bread. The apostle Paul was with them. In fact, Paul was preaching to them. And because Paul had to leave the very next day on a very long journey, Paul decides to preach on and on and on until midnight. Now, there were many soft burning lamps in the room upstairs where the meeting was being held, and there was a certain young man named Eutychus. Eutychus was seated on the windowsill, listening to Paul as he preached. <laughs> Slowly and gradually, Eutychus began to drift into a deep sleep from Paul's preaching. So much so that at one point of time, he literally fell off the windowsill. And from the third story, he went crashing down to the ground. And he was picked up dead. Paul and all the other believers, they went running down to check on Eutychus. Paul picked the young man in his arms and said, don't be alarmed, he is alive. And then all the believers, they returned back upstairs. Paul broke bread, they all ate. After which Paul continued to teach until the wee hours of the morning. And then he left on his journey. And the believers? They took Eutychus back home, alive, greatly comforted.
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so what made Eutychus fall asleep at a prayer meeting? Excuse me, Moa. And I hope there are none fast asleep out here in this prayer meeting. <laughs> and if you are neighbors, kindly ensure they don't fall off their seats, will ya? <laughs> what are the symptoms of spiritual apathy that we can learn from this story for us to be vigilant about? Let's take a look. One. Could Eutychus have fallen asleep because of the late hour? Now, because Paul had to leave the very next day on a long journey, he went preaching on and on and on until midnight. And in all fairness, you know, probably it was the lateness of the hour coupled with the constancy in the tone of Paul's voice, aggravated by the lengthy, never-ending sermon. And that is what might have lulled Eutychus into a deep sleep. But then, hey, there were other believers at that meeting too, isn't it? Besides Eutychus. And they didn't fall asleep. In fact, they fellowshiped with Paul until the wee hours of the next morning. So then why is it that the same set of circumstances elicited such a different response in these two sets of people? Of course, it is because of the condition of their hearts. To all my married brothers and sisters, you know, I'm sure you remember your honeymoon days. <laughs> oh, those sweet early days of marriage. How you would stay awake into the wee hours of the morning, simply loving one another, talking sweet little nothings to each other, and yet paying such rapt attention to each other. In those sweet early days of marriage, loving one another, listening, paying attention to each other, it came so easily, so naturally. Why? <laughs> because your hearts were bursting with passionate love for each other, isn't it? Then what happened? Well, as the months and the years went by, routine, familiarity crept in. You know, like there's a saying in Hindi, ghar ki murgi dal barabar. That same voice that once used to make your heart go boom, boom, and give you fever. Now that very voice sounds like incessant nagging. And it's the very thing that puts you into a deep slumber. So what happened? The embers of your passionate love grew cold, lukewarm with familiarity and routine. And unless we are careful, this is exactly what could happen with regard for our love for the Lord. 2 Chronicles 25 tells us the story of King Amaziah the king of Judah. Scripture tells us that King Amaziah always did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not with a true heart. You know, he was only 25 years old when he was made the king of Judah. And at that tender age, he passionately loved God. He always wanted to do what pleased God. One time, the enemy the Edomites, they decided to attack the land of Judah. So when King Amaziah got to know about this, he, he took inventory of his troop, of his army, and he felt that the 300,000 soldiers that he had with him in, on his side, they were not enough to fight the battle. So he decides to rent, to bring on hire, an additional 100,000 soldiers from the neighboring land of Israel. And for this, he had to pay a very hefty price. He had to pay four tons of silver. Well, the deal was closed. The four tons of silver were delivered. The 100,000 soldiers were inducted into Amaziah's army. 
and they were all set for battle. When suddenly a prophet of the Lord appears before King Amaziah and says, My dear king, thus says the Lord, the men of Israel must not march with you, for the Lord our God is not with Israel. And King Amaziah said, what about the deal that has already been closed? Four tons of silver have already been delivered. What about that? And the, soul, and the prophet said, surely the Lord can give you so much more than that. And so King Amaziah forfeited the price he had paid. Four tons of silver, he just let it go. He let the 100,000 soldiers just go without any service at all. And because of his obedience to the Lord, the Lord granted him an amazing victory against the Edomites. But then, as time went by, King Amaziah became a wee bit too familiar with the favor of God. God's abundant showers of blessings upon his life became kind of routine, no big deal. He began to take the Lord our God for granted. So much so that he began to admire the false gods, the idols of Seir. One day he brought all those idols into his house. He began to bow down, worship them, offer sacrifices to them. What happened to King Amaziah? A man who was once so passionately in love with God, now bowing down to idols? Well, he just let his love for the Lord grow lukewarm, cold, with familiarity and routine. And we too must be very careful not to take our Lord's blessings for granted, not to let our love for the Lord grow lukewarm and be replaced by the idols of the world. Jesus says to the church in Ephesus in, in Revelation chapter 2, verses 2 onwards, and maybe we could relate with this. Jesus says, I know your deeds. I know that you have persevered and that you have endured many hardships on account of my name, and you have not grown weary. But this one thing I hold against you You have forsaken the love that you had for me at first. Yet another example of lukewarm love, once again from the book of Revelations. The city of Laodicea. It was a, a really thriving, a very prosperous city situated on the, on the Lycus River. It was prosperous because it was the hub for, you know, the fashion industry. It was here that a very glossy, uh, a soft black wool was invented. And this black wool was exported all over the world, bringing large revenues into Laodicea. It was also the hub for uh, the, the medicine school. It was here that a very special eye ointment was uh, made. And this eye ointment, again, was exported all over the world, bringing in large revenues to Laodicea. It was literally the hub for all banking and commerce activities. It thrived. And how were the people of Laodicea? Passionately in love and grateful to God for all of these abundant blessings? Well, you can think again. You know, there were many uh, mineral springs in Laodicea. Once again, a big blessing from the Lord because people from far and wide lands, they would come to bathe in the water of these minerals, mineral springs because the waters would bring them healing and good health. Now, the waters of these springs had a very flat taste because they were full of minerals. And the water was lukewarm, tepid, almost nauseating, insipid to drink. 
And humorously, this is exactly how Jesus describes the people of Laodicea. In Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 onwards, Jesus says, I know your deeds. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other, but because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. So then I think it would be a good idea for us to check the temperatures of our heart. Are we fiery hot, lukewarm, cold? Please, can we all raise our hands up to heaven in prayer? Can we? And please repeat this prayer after me. Lord, let zeal for your house burn in me like a fire. Amen. Second, could Eutychus have fallen asleep because of the many burning lamps? Now, you know, there were many soft burning lamps in the room upstairs where the meeting was being held. And once again, in all probability, the warm, the soft light from the lamps, that is what might have lulled Eutychus into a deep, contented sleep. And the spiritual takeaway for us from this is that sometimes, you know, we are so content with carrying our own little sweet lamp of salvation. We're so content associating ourselves with others who carry their own sweet little lamp of salvation that we turn an apathetic eye to the other billions of people out there who sit in complete spiritual darkness. They carry no lamp, for they know not the Lord. In John chapter 5, it, Jesus meets an invalid. Is that? Yeah. The invalid was literally seated so close to the pool of healing waters. And he was seated there so close to the pool for 38 long years. And Jesus asked him, do you want to be healed? And what the invalid said was really sad. He said, sir, there is nobody to help me into the water. And that invalid represents the billions of people who are sitting in spiritual darkness. They need a helping hand. They need a Christian hand, your hand, to lead them to the Lord to lead them to the baptismal waters of Christ. In Luke chapter 8, verses 16, Jesus said, nobody lights a lamp and then, you know, hides it in a clay jar or puts it under a bed. No, instead they will place the lamp on a lampstand so that all those who enter may see the light. So let us place our lamps on a lampstand so that all the spiritual invalids will see and be drawn to the light of Christ. You know, we don't have to be an eloquent preacher. We don't have to be a beautiful praise and worship leader or a mighty miracle worker to do this. No. All we need to do is simply live our life like Christ. Whatever we say, whatever we do, let us be like Christ, which I tell you is the more difficult part. And we will be like cities that are set on a hill that cannot be hidden, that all see the good works we do, and they will be drawn to our Father in heaven. So please, can we raise our hands up one more time and repeat this prayer after me? Lord, Lord. I am my brother's keeper. Help me, lead him to thee. Amen. And finally, could it be that Eutychus fell asleep because he was seated on the windowsill? Now, the windowsill was a seat of distraction. 
because it took Eutychus's focus off the things of God that were being discussed at the meeting and instead onto the passing, the distracting things of the world. And in all probability, once again, it was because of this distraction that Eutychus fell asleep on Paul. You know, the innkeeper in the Christmas story, he also was very distracted with the passing, distracting things of the world. It was a very busy time for him. People from all over were coming to register for the census and probably he was busy with providing all of them clean linen, clean rooms, hot water, cooked food. And in all that busyness, he turned an apathetic ear to the pleas of the Lord. He turned down and gave no room to a heavily pregnant Mother Mary and he instead sent her to the stables to give birth amongst the animals. His apathetic attitude cost him very heavily an opportunity to meet with the Lord. And just like the innkeeper, we too are so distracted with the things of the world, aren't we? Our our jobs, our, our deadlines, our, our investments, the money market, the share market, the, everything. It's so distracting that just like the innkeeper, we too end up saying, sorry, Lord, no room. No room for prayers. No room to read your Bible. No room for mass. Just like Eutychus, we too end up sleeping on the Lord. Jesus says to the church of Sardis in, in Revelations chapter 3 again. Jesus says, I know your deeds. You have a name for being alive, but you are dead. Arise therefore and strengthen what remains and is at the point of death. For I have not found your works perfect in the eyes of my Lord. Again, please, can we raise our hands up and say this prayer after me? Lord, I hear you knock. I open the doors of my heart. Come and live in me. Amen. Okay. Now quickly, let us look at how to revive, enhance the spiritual fervor in our life. First, it's very simple. Just ask. It says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. So simply ask, Lord, make me hungry for thee. And it will be granted you. You know, when you're invited to a great banquet where there is the best meals served, the best wines, and the best desserts. But if you have no hunger, then you will not be able to make the most of that banquet. And in the same way, our Lord Jesus has blessed us with such a great spiritual banquet. There is the Mass, the Eucharist, the sacraments, the praise and worship, the Word of God. But unless we have spiritual hunger, will not be able to fully savor the sweetness of the Lord. So why not simply ask? Let's raise our hands up again and say, Lord, make me hungry for a day. Amen. Second, rekindle the fires of your love. You know, just like in a marriage, you, you both, husband and wife, you make a deliberate effort to keep the flame of your passion burning bright. In the same way, make a deliberate effort to keep the flame of your love for the Lord burning bright. You all would make every attempt to, to look physically appealing to your spouse, wouldn't you? You would, uh, you know, work out to get rid of all the excess flab. You would maybe do all the works in the salon, the facial, the manicures, the pedicures, the keratin treatment, the hair implants. You would do all this to look appealing to your spouse. So why not beautify yourself for the Lord? 
The Lord, of course, is not interested in our physical beauty, but he is very interested in the beauty of our heart. So beautify that heart for him. Work it out. Get rid of all the flab of the world, the, the hatred, the envy, the resentment, the bitterness. Get rid of it all. Declutter. And then beautify your heart with prayers, with praise and worship, with the word of God. Also, you know, just like you would pack off your children to a retreat, to a picnic, or to your relatives, just so that you can have some sweet alone time with your spouse. Maybe you would have a candlelight dinner, talk to one another, and listen to one another like old times. Listen to some music and waltz with each other. In the same way, spend some sweet alone time with the Lord. Talk to Him. Listen to him, sing to him, dance with him. The more time you spend with the Lord, the deeper in love you will definitely fall with him. So once again, raise your hands up to heaven just to keep you all awake. <laughs> Say, Lord, enkindle in me the fire of your love. Amen. And the last point. Practice his presence. You know, God has blessed us all with imagination, and, and it's a great gift. Unfortunately, we use this imagination for all the wrong purposes, to imagine plots and plans and evil revenge or lust. No. Instead, why not use our imagination for spiritual purposes? Say, for example, when you're at Mass, with the spiritual eyes of your mind, see all the saints and the angels all worshiping the Lord and join them in prayers and in song. You know, it's very sad how some of us, not all of us, participate in, in, in the Mass. We don't sing. Some don't sing because they feel that singing is the choir's job. Some of us don't sing because we feel that we don't sing well enough. But that's not true. God's not interested in how well we can carry a note. He's only interested that we become like little children and we sing to him with all our heart. So please sing. Remember, singing is twice prayer. Also, when you pray, please let us not ramble along like a fast train. Okay, it's not a Formula One race. How would you speak to somebody you love? Slowly, you know, savoring every word. In the same way, speak to the Lord slowly and enjoy every word, every loving word that you say to him. And when you participate in Mass like this, holy praying and singing, you will be on fire for the Lord. Also, you know, with your, with your imagination, imagine Jesus by your side all through the day, 24-7. Talk to him. Involve him in your daily activities, in your daily decisions, and you will be best friends forever. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.